The method of least squares is widely used to fit curves to data. In this video, I aim to show you what the least squares formula is and why it's so powerful. With the help of a collaborator, this lesson is designed to be interactive, so please follow the link in the description if you want to get the most valuable learning experience. I should also mention that this video will assume some knowledge about linear algebra and a hint of multivariable calculus. But don't worry if you don't know about that stuff. I've designed this video so that even someone with the knowledge of basic high school calculus can still get a good idea of what least squares is all about. Okay, let's get started. Here, we have a graph with a bunch of data points on it. What we want to do right now is find the equation of a line that best fits this data. The equation of the line we want to fit the data to will have the form y is equal to b times x, where b is just a constant that determines the slope of the line. Now my question to you is this, what is the best value of b that fits this data? Feel free to play around with this slider yourself until you think you have the best fit. No math is required at this point, just use your intuition. It looks to me like the best fit occurs when b is somewhere between 0.5 and 0.7. Keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, now I know what you're thinking. There must be a way to calculate the best value of b using math, right? Well, there is, but we just need to define our problem a little bit better. How would you define the line of best fit? Well, maybe one way is to draw vertical lines that connect our data points to the function, like this. Notice that when our function doesn't make a good fit, the length of these orange lines generally gets larger. And when it does appear to make a good fit, the length of these lines get smaller. Perhaps one way to define the best fit is to find the best b value that minimizes the combined length of these vertical lines. Or, maybe another way is to draw perpendicular lines from the function to the data points. This seems like a natural choice, right? After all, the fit seems better when the length of these lines are smaller, so maybe we should define the best fit as the value of b that minimizes the combined length of the perpendicular lines. Or, how about this? Why not create little squares that fit between the data points and the function like this? The area of these squares seem to get smaller when the fit seems better, so maybe finding the value of b which minimizes the combined area of these squares is the best way to go. Now, admittedly, all this must appear quite subjective, and as it turns out, there are pros and cons to each of the possible definitions I've outlined. But my aim in this video is to show you that this third option of getting the least squared error is not only absolutely reasonable, but also extremely computationally efficient. So, now that we have the problem well defined, let's find all the areas of these squares. We'll begin by drawing vertical lines again. Each data point can be labeled x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, x4, y4, x5, y5, and x6, y6 and we'll call the residual length of these lines R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, and R6. The residual length associated with this point, for example, is found by subtracting the y-coordinate of the function, in this case, b times x6, from the y-coordinate of the data point, y6. So, that means R6 is equal to b times x6 minus y6. That's the length of this line. This can be done for all of the data points, like so. And now that we have the r values, we can easily find the area of all of the squares, r1 squared, r2 squared, r3 squared, r4 squared, r5 squared, and r6 squared. Now I'm going to define the variable error as the sum of these areas, r1 squared plus r2 squared plus all the way to r6 squared. And so our problem can be stated mathematically as min error b, which is math nerds speak for 
find the value of b that minimizes this variable which we've called error. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, I've decided to plot error, the sum of all of our squares, versus b for you here. And so, as you can see, the relationship happens to be parabolic. Feel free to play around with this, and you'll see that large values of b and low values of b correspond to large errors. Also notice that there is one and only one global minimum, and this is the value of b that produces the best fit. Now admittedly, I haven't proven to you yet that the relationship between error and our parameter b is convex and parabolic. But that's because I want you to feel that it's true before I prove to you that it's true. I also want to show you that the point of this minimum error is when the slope here, which is d error db, is exactly zero. Okay, now we're ready to jump into the math. So what we've shown so far is that the error, which I'll write as lowercase e, is just r1 squared plus r2 squared plus on and on to rn squared. This error term here is what we want to minimize. Now how do we do that? Well, the residual from the first data point is r1, which as we discussed before is just bx1 minus y1. Likewise, r2 is bx2 minus y2, and this continues all the way to rn is equal to bxn minus yn. And we know that the minimum of the error occurs when the slope, dedb, is equal to zero. Now we have all the information we need to solve this problem. All we need to do is plug these values of r1, r2, r3, etc. into the expression we have for error. So, let's do that. When we substitute all the values for r1, r2, etc., we will get this expression for error. Now let's expand each of these brackets by squaring each of the terms. Now let's group the terms multiplied by b squared, and group the terms multiplied by b, and group all the other terms together too. When we group these coefficients together, we get this. Now take a moment to realize that this is the equation of a parabola. And even more than that, because the coefficient of b squared here is greater than or equal to zero, this is actually a convex parabola. This proves what I showed before, that the error versus b curve will always be an upward facing parabola, which means that there will always be one and only one global optimum a fantastic advantage of the least squares method. Now let's find that optimum value by solving for dedb is equal to zero. If we differentiate the expression above with respect to b, then we get this. Then we set this expression equal to zero. Solving for b is easy from here. Divide by two, bring the constant terms to the other side, and divide by the x squared terms. And there we go. This is the value of b that produces the best fit. In our data set, this value turns out to be about 0.62. Notice this value is consistent with what we showed with the parabola plot, and it's also in line with our intuition as well. This fit looks pretty good. What we just showed really gets to the heart of what the least squares fitting is all about. But it's actually way more powerful than that. And to truly show you its power, I'll have to dive into some linear algebra and multivariable calculus. But don't worry, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Imagine you have a data set that looks like this, and you want to try and fit it with a more general line, y is equal to a plus bx. Now we have two parameters to find, a and b. The parameter a moves the line up and down, and the parameter b changes the angle of the line. I encourage you to play around with these values to see if you can find a good fit for yourselves. Now as you may have guessed, there is a way to calculate the best values of a and b. Let's start by finding the residual lengths just like before. r1 is just the difference between the function, a plus bx1, and the data point, y1. r2 is similar, it's just a plus bx2 minus y2 r3 is a plus bx3 minus y3, and this goes all the way to the nth data point. 
Also, just like last time, we'll define the error, the thing we want to minimize, as the summed area of these squares, r1 squared plus r2 squared plus on and on to rn squared. But unlike last time, before I jump into the math, let me introduce you to some unavoidable linear algebra. The residual equations that I have here can actually be expressed more compactly using a matrix equation. Let's define a vector that contains all of the residual terms, r1, r2, r3, etc. Believe it or not, this vector is equal to some 6 by 2 matrix times a vector containing our unknown parameters a and b minus the vector that contains all y data values. Now the first equation is 1 times a plus x1 times b minus y1. The second equation is 1 times a plus x2 times b minus y2, and so on. And so our matrix will look like this. I'll call the residual vector r, I'll call this matrix a, and I'll call this vector containing our unknown parameters x, and I'll call this vector b. Now this might seem like crazy, abstract, and unnecessary linear algebra to you right now, but trust me, writing this in matrix form really does end up simplifying things. For example, the error term we just derived, r1 squared plus r2 squared plus on and on to rn squared, can actually be written more compactly as the dot product of the r vector with itself, r transpose r, which can also be written as the 2 norm of ax minus b. Okay, but that's enough about that. Let's take a step back and focus on the problem again. Now, as it turns out, Remarkably, when we plot this error, we'll get this multi-dimensional parabola called a paraboloid. As you can see, the error is plotted against our parameters a and b. Just like last time, the best fit will occur at the point that minimizes this error. Now let's have a think about how we can quantify this minimum point. Well, if we keep b fixed and vary a, then the minimum can only occur when the slope of the error versus the a-curve is zero. In other words, where the partial derivative of error with respect to a is zero. Likewise, if we keep a fixed and vary b, then we can see that the minimum can only occur when the slope of the error versus b-curve is zero. And now we're armed with everything we need to solve our minimization problem. And that minimization problem can be stated as follows. The error e is given by r1 squared plus r2 squared plus on and on to rn squared. And we know that the minimum error occurs when the partial of e with respect to a is zero, and the partial of e with respect to b is zero. The first derivative is done by bringing the two out the front and multiplying by the del r del a terms. The second equation is calculated using the same method. We can actually write these two equations in matrix form. First, notice that we can divide out the 2's from both equations. Next, we seek to express the left-hand side of the equations as some matrix times a vector containing all the residual terms r1, r2, r3, etc. From the first equation, we can see that the first row of this matrix must contain all the partial derivatives with respect to a. And from the second equation, we can see that the second row must contain all the partial derivatives with respect to b. And on the right-hand side, we'll just get the zero vector, zero, zero. Now recall that these residual values in this case are just given by the formula ri is equal to a plus bxi minus yi. This means that the partial of ri with respect to a is just 1, and the partial of ri with respect to b is just xi. And now let's plug these results into the matrix equation above. Whoa! This matrix is the same A matrix we derived earlier, except flipped on its side. It's A transpose. And this vector R here is just the residual vector that we defined earlier too. And for the math nerds who are watching this, this general matrix here is called the Jacobian matrix transposed. 
Okay, so what we have here at the end of all this calculus in linear algebra is that our optimum value occurs when a transpose r is equal to zero. But don't forget that the residual vector is just a times x minus b, so let's sub that in. Let's multiply the a transpose through and bring the a transpose b to the right hand side. Now if a transpose a is invertible, then we can solve for the vector x by inverting both sides. And oh my god, we've done it. We've found the vector x which contains the parameters of the fitting function f of x is equal to a plus bx. With just a single equation, we get the vector x which contains the optimal values a and b. This solution is remarkably compact and can easily and efficiently be implemented in software. For example, MATLAB can easily calculate all of this blue stuff here using the pseudo inverse command pinva. In fact, with just a few lines of code, it's possible to extract the optimal parameters a and b. In our example, it's a is equal to 1.07 and b is equal to 0 0.98 which is very much within agreement of what would expect a good fit to look like intuitively. And so there we go, we've had a deep dive into how the least squares method works. Under the hood, it's just a really elegant and efficient formula that's derived using a mixture of multivariable calculus and linear algebra. Oh, and by the way, if you weren't scared away by the linear algebra in this video, then I've also made another proof that you might like as well. Feel free to check that out too. Anyway, thanks so much for watching guys. Cheers.